In these gray and latter days, how dark the times can seem. One of the great darknesses of modern Christianity in America is what we've forgotten that Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 15. We have forgotten about the resurrection of the dead. The congregation in Corinth had also forgotten about it to some extent. They were arguing over a great many things. They were arguing over whether you could get drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were arguing over whether or not you could sleep with your mother-in-law. But they were also arguing about whether or not there was such a thing as the resurrection of the dead. Today, we're not arguing about it. Today, we have just forgotten it. Today, most Christians only believe in dying and going to heaven. And they talk about it as if it's some very exciting thing, that I will now be disembodied forever and float around in some sort of space light place. And we wonder why our kids look at us a little confused. And they ask these questions, what will it be like? And we try to tell them, don't worry about it, it'll be good. I remember vividly when I was teaching fifth grade, sixth grade, and eighth grade at a Lutheran school in the classroom talking about the future and the life everlasting. And a child raised his hand and he said, Pastor, is it wrong of me that I am afraid of going to heaven? I'm afraid of being without a body. Now this was a child who had been going to church every week. He wasn't just one of those kids who came to the school. He was there every week, which means I know every week he confessed either the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. And so I said to him amazingly, how can you say you will not have a body? Don't you listen to what we say every week in church? I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. But it is so in the water now, this idea that we just die and go to heaven and that's it. Well, that we don't even really know where to begin. As I preach this, I know I have to be a little bit careful because some of you are probably like, wait a minute, what? There's no heaven? No, it's not what I said. If you die now, you're with Christ in heaven, you are kept safe. No problem. That's just not the goal. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about Christ's body dead and Christ's body resurrected from the dead as the first fruits of your body resurrected from the dead and all creation resurrected from the dead. And Paul's going to make that clear. No uncertain terms here. Verse 21 of chapter 15 is also very powerful for our present age, which puts such hope in secular material evolution. I got no problem with the variation of the species. I got no problem with survival of the fittest causing certain animals to have certain traits come and go. But I do have a problem with believing that over billions of years, nothing became something and chaos became organized. And I doubly have a problem because in order for that to happen, in order for the amoeba to become the fish, to become the the monkey, to become the man, and I know it's not supposed to be in that direct order, there's common ancestry and all that, but to move from, uh, from chaos to complex, there has to be death before man. You start with primordial life, and there's a lot of death, and a lot of death, and a lot of death, billions of years of death, and then eventually mankind comes around. And Christianity preaches something so different than that, you cannot possibly harmonize it. Death came from Adam the first man. However God made the world in those six days, the good that was there, there was no death. And whatever we observe now, whatever we see now, whatever the decay rate of carbon is now, it wasn't there when God created the world. That came with the fall and decay. There was no decay before this. And Paul says it so clearly here. This is not Genesis chapter 1. This is 1 Corinthians 15. He says the same thing in Romans 6. As by a man came death, By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead, which doubly is important. Because if you deny that by a man came death, what do you do in believing that Jesus is your Savior? He's the resurrection that brings life. You don't believe uh, one man can bring death? Then you can't believe this guy brings life. You can't have it both ways. Either he's the answer to Adam's fall, or we are liars as Christians, as the text said last week. We We are impersonating God and proclaiming something that is not true, that there is no resurrection. Now, Paul says, of course, we know historically 500 witnesses and more saw it, even at one time. The evidence stacks up if you want to study it according to the real rules of history and not just liberal propaganda. Jesus, in fact, did have an empty tomb, and he did appear to people. And the only explanation of all of those events is either there's a stolen body that somehow converted Saul of Tarsus, who was a persecutor of the church, which makes no sense, or there's a resurrected body who converted Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of the church, by appearing to him on the Damascus Road. As in Adam all die, verse 22, 
so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice that death comes to everybody, sin comes to everybody, original sin is given to everybody, we inherit it. The baby, born, a sinner. A sinner. That's why babies die, because they're sinners. So as death comes to everybody, the promise is for everybody. This is not a baptismal text, but the promise of Christ is for everybody, and baptism is the promise of Christ, and Jordan's going to get it in a few moments. We're going to smack him with the name of God and water on his forehead, and he will be put into this body, not the wooden one, but the real one 2,000 years ago, and killed with Jesus. And also, 2,000 years ago, three days, walk out of the tomb with Jesus. And that will be his gift from God to believe the rest of his life as he looks for it to come to pass on the last day when his body actually comes out of the grave. What a glorious thing. Each in his own order, verse 23, explains, I've said it already, so I won't dwell on it, that Christ's body is the first fruits. He's raised first. Then at his coming, right, at the end of time when he returns, those who belong to Christ, that's us, coming out of the grave. Then, verse 24 is a little confusing. Then comes the end, but it's only the beginning, the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, excuse me, the kingdom to God the Father. This is after he, Jesus, has destroyed every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So somehow, at the very end, when the lamb is upon the throne, and he is reigning over us all, and we're casting down our crowns around the glassy sea and proclaiming, Hallelujah, glory be to the lamb, and all the tears are wiped from our eyes, never to return. Somehow, at that moment, Jesus is going to turn and hand us all back to the Father. I don't know what that's going to look like or what it will be like. This is like the only place where this is explained, so I can't go further than that. But I do know that this is a demonstration of his own godhood. Because he does this only after everything that has ever stood against God has been destroyed by him, put under his feet. And that is very much what we are in the midst of right now. You sit there and you wonder, why doesn't the government work? Because... The government has set itself against God. God created authority. God created governments with the power of the sword to do good. But they have set themselves against God to make themselves the place of God or the answer to to rule and define things like marriage and things like life over and against what creation and science would tell us. And so Jesus is indeed letting it all collapse. He's destroying it. He's got his feet up on it, showing that as hard as they try to move around and get out from underneath him, you cannot get away from it. You cannot undo who he is. And this whole world is then going to continually, chaotically collapse upon itself until that archangel shout comes out and says, fine, see, I've proven it now. And here I am to put it all right again. In the midst of that, you believe he already has that power. You believe that no matter how chaotic it looks, it is indeed ordered by him. It's moving toward that end of your resurrection by him. His goal is not for you to have your best life right now. His goal is for you to retain your faith that you're in Jesus right now. And everything else is for that sake, for that to happen. Paul, in verses 30 in the middle here, gets a little more into the the private argument where he's trying to say, look, What am I doing as an apostle if there's no resurrection from the dead? Why would I be brave enough to fight wild beasts, laying down my life, being willing to die, if I didn't think there was a resurrection of the dead? He's he's basically saying, if I didn't believe that, I would have run. I would not have fought against those wild beasts. I would have taken off because they they had a chance to kill me. But I believe I'm going to be raised from the dead. So, whatever it was, we don't even know what the story came from. Was he protecting people? Was he thrown to them in, in a pit? I don't know. But whatever it was, he's saying, I wouldn't have done it. If I didn't believe this, but since I believed it, I was willing to do that. If the dead are not raised, he also says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And this is a fact. If this life is all we have, you should go do drugs and sleep with prostitutes and do whatever you can to find as much pleasure as you can right now because, frankly, you're dust and it's over soon. Don't tell the young man to stop playing video games. That's the right thing to do when you have no hope. Just sit there and waste your life till you die. That's it. If there is no God, there is no design or purpose. There is only chaotic mess. And pretending otherwise is simple tomfoolery. It's sophistry. It's pretending that you have ideas. That's what he says. Go get drunk and die. Whatever. But see, he doesn't actually think that because he thinks there's a design and a purpose because there is a God. And the God doesn't want to leave us in our own evil that we've made. He wants to pull us out of that. That's the point of the cross. That's the point of the resurrection that now, knowing that future, our minds are renewed to see the good that should be. Which is not to 
lie in a hedonistic, pleasure-soaked stupor, hoping for your next high, but instead to see the good of those around you and how much they need you. As Jesus said, to look at your enemy, and instead of hating your enemy, say, my enemy is one who needs mercy. And as God has given me mercy, so I will give him mercy. Do not be deceived, he says. Bad company ruins good morals or good character. It is to say, the words that you surround your life with will be the words that you believe. We like to think that we are in charge of coming up with our own ideas, but none of us are that strong. What goes in the human head eventually is what comes out the human head. You can endure one lie, but if the same lie is told to you over and over again, it'll eventually move you on the barometer. Don't be deceived by that. You're no island. You need the right words. And so he kind of yells at him now, right? Wake up from your drunken stupor. And they're not drunk. Well, actually, some of them are drunk at church. But his point is less about actual drinking and more about not being aware of what they believe, not knowing why they believe it, not having a love for the doctrine which is their life. Thinking it's just some sort of nonsense memorization stuff they had to do as kids. As opposed to real ideas with real consequences for every day from now until judgment. Wake up, he says. Know that there's a meaning, he says. This is right. And do not go on sinning, that is, walking blindly. He's not saying stop being sinful, period, and never have an evil evil thought. You can't do that. But he is saying find your evil thoughts and hate them. Find your evil acts and repent of them. Find your sins this last week and confess them for absolution. And then come and have it covered in the blood of Christ and the sacraments. That's what he means by do not go on sinning. He says, and this is to the shame of that congregation, some of you have no knowledge of God. Can I say that of this congregation? Our confessions teach that within every Christian congregation there are both believers and hypocrites. By hypocrites it means those who do not believe but just go through the motions. I'll let your conscience accuse you. I'll tell you also that if you're accused, you're not a hypocrite. The hypocrite's not listening to what I'm saying. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? Now we get to some good news. This is fun. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? I remember seeing a meme a few years ago about zombie Jesus. Making fun of how Christians believe in zombie Jesus. Because he died, but he didn't really stay dead. He came back out. And it was this picture of Christ appearing and resurrected. But he had like rotting flesh everywhere. And it was so funny. Ha ha. But see, that's this question. What kind of body can be raised from the dead? And Paul says, that's a stupid question. Not only does it deny the power of God to do what God will do as creator, as redeemer, as sanctifier, but it doesn't even pay attention to nature. And then he uses in nature this example of the seed. You sow a seed, and that's not what you're going to grow. You're going to grow an entire plant out of that seed. That seed falls to the ground and it dies but it comes up with a totally different kind of body. Then he goes on to talk about how there's all sorts of bodies in the world as well. You got, you got animals, you got fish, you got stars. They all look different. His point in this is simply to say that God can do what God wants to do. And so if God wants to put your body into the grave as a punishment against your unbelief and then raise it from the dead, he can do whatever he wants. And the hope in this, catch this, is that your body in the grave is like a seed. Think about a seed in your hand. Is it beautiful? Well, I guess in a scientific way, yes, but it's not a flower, right? But that's what goes down. What comes up is the flowering plant. That's your body at the resurrection. This only says we can't even conceive of how good it's going to be. The transition, the change, the metamorphosis, the transfiguration will be beyond understanding but good with the glory that a flower has over the seed from which it grew. So it is with the resurrection of the dead, he says. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. That's the start of another section. What is sown mortal is raised immortal. I've been telling you this for about a year now, St. Paul. You are immortals now. If you ever have to fight with wild beasts, like that guy in California who killed the mountain lion, by the way. How cool was that? Did you hear about this? He was, he's running, in the, just jogging, mountain lion attacks. Kills it with his bare hands. I want to be that guy. Like, I don't, but I, I want to be that guy. That's, that's amazing. You can do that 
Not to go kill mountain lions, don't get me wrong, don't go chase them down. But you can be fearless in every moment, even one that terrifying, because even if the mountain lion killed you, Lord, have mercy. I'm baptized into Christ. Our Father who art in heaven, deliver me from evil. I die in that moment, and then I'm with Christ in paradise, waiting, singing, longing, and then last day, rising. And whatever that beast did to me, it's not there anymore. For I am indeed perfected and immortal and imperishable with the body of Christ rather than this old husk I got from Adam. That's what Paul does not want you to forget, period. Even though, again, I would say that this modern church in general has. And doubly so, as if it were designed, that is what we're going to do to Jordan in just a moment. We're going to take him. We're going to kill him. We're going to raise him. He will be an immortal in just a couple minutes. In the name of Jesus. Amen.